Gamers, if you aren't perpetually online like I am, you might have missed this completely. But we just got some pretty huge news this week that could mark a substantial shift in Disney's philosophy when it comes to Star Wars games. This news goes beyond even their decisions not to renew EA's exclusive license for Star Wars games, which expires sometime next year. Earlier this week, Insider Gaming reported that Disney wants a new Star Wars game releasing every six months. According to Insider, quote, it's understood that Disney wants one major AAA title and one smaller game per fiscal year, end quote. Now, I think we all know that Star Wars games have been in a pretty sorry state since about 2010. It's not even really fair to blame EA for how things have gone, at least not fully. Granted, EA's made some pretty terrible decisions as the stewards of Star Wars games, and they're known to have canceled some games like Amy Hedig's Project Ragtag simply because it wasn't monetizable in the same way that something like FIFA is. It's just a fact that over the past 20 years, games have become exponentially more difficult and expensive to develop. And at the same time, the market of people who buy games, gamers if you will, has grown exponentially as well. So games have greater potential than ever for massive sales. We can see this played out if we compare new releases to older games. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, for example, sold fairly well for a single player title with at least 10 million sales as of March 2020, five months after the game's launch. But compare this reasonably successful selling game to the all-time best-selling Nintendo 64 library. It'd be in second place behind Super Mario 64, even if you assume that it didn't sell a single copy since March 2020. In short, market growth is overpowered, and the fact that gaming has become exponentially more popular with mass market audiences than it was in the early 2000s has driven increases in the total number of games made, as well as increases in their size and quality. Getting these massive games comes with a cost. Games have to be massively successful now in order to pay for themselves. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask sold 3.3 million copies in the year 2000 across all markets. If a mainline Zelda game today sold 3 million copies, people at Nintendo would be losing their jobs. This pressure to overperform is especially present on licensed games, and I think this is really what Star Wars has suffered from over the past decade or so. When AAA games without a licensing cost already need to be smash hits in order to justify their production investment, and then you add a licensing cost on top of that, it makes an already bad problem so much worse. I think there's a good argument to be made that The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, arguably the best licensed game ever made, if not just flat out one of the best games ever made, couldn't have been made without its very developer generous licensing agreement. Because that enabled the less successful precursor games, The Witcher and The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings, to be made and to thrive. Disney isn't likely going to give up any licensing money, so they seem to be going with the only other business strategy that makes sense, making just as many small games that don't cost as much to get more frequent releases, and if one of these games isn't wildly successful then it isn't a huge financial hit the way it would be if a AAA release bombed. EA already seemed to be heading in this direction before it was announced that their exclusive license wouldn't be renewed past 2023. Their early focus on heavily monetizable multiplayer focused games was an obvious failure after 2017 and their shift towards single player content was welcome. In 2020 they dipped their toe into the pool of smaller, more contained games with Star Wars Squadrons from EA Motive. This X-Wing vs TIE Fighter like space shooter is a really confusing release. A budget title launching at $40 in a genre that hasn't been massively popular since the late 90s, with a single player campaign lasting around 8 hours, VR and HOTA support, two multiplayer modes, no battle pass, no microtransactions, or paid DLC. I honestly think, and I'll tell anybody who listens, that Squadrons is an essential gameplay experience for any Star Wars fan, and I stand by that opinion, but I still marvel at the fact that this game was even made. And then I remember what's really surprising. EA made this game, so they have to recognize the value in making games like this, and since Disney wants one game like this every year, clearly they do as well. Games don't have to be massive 100 hour long AAA juggernauts to be good or even to sell well. The greatest era ever in Star Wars gaming in my mind was the prequel trilogy era, specifically 2002 through about 2006 when we got Rogue Squadron 2, Jedi Outcast, Jedi Academy, Bounty Hunter, Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2, the MMORPG Star Wars Galaxies, Battlefront 1 and 2, Republic Commando, and Empire at War, all in the span of about 4 years. And these aren't the only Star Wars games that released in that window. I didn't even mention at least a dozen others, just the ones that I thought were really good. That's 11 really good Star Wars games in 4 years compared to 4 console and PC Star Wars games total in the past 10 years, while the focus has been on large scale, heavily monetizable, infinitely playable experiences. 
My earnest hope is that this news from Disney marks a shift in how Star Wars games are made back to the old way. There's space for both sorts of games to exist in today's market and be successful, demonstrated by the success of Squadrons for what it was. I want another five-year period where we get 10 good Star Wars games more than I can honestly describe. Hell, at this point, I'd settle for getting that over a 10-year period. Obviously, with a release schedule like that, there's a danger of giving people brand fatigue, but I don't think this is an issue as long as Lucasfilm Games plays their hand correctly. If they were giving us AAA games every year that are all the same action-adventure game or first-person shooter, then yeah, it's a definite risk. So they should be smart and not do that, and instead look at the heyday of Star Wars games that I just talked about. The reason people didn't get brand fatigue is because Star Wars just became the backdrop for a bunch of very different games in different genres. Action combat, arcade space shooters, realistic space sims, MMOs, action hack and slash, vehicular combat, traditional RPGs, first person shooters, racing games, real time and turn based strategies, all these genres were covered and people didn't get tired of the games, the games just stopped coming. I think someone at Lucasfilm has to realize this since Respawn is already making a strategy game. Strategy isn't typically the most profitable genre, and it's not the sort of game that you expect EA to make, so reading between the lines here, I think they're on the right track. To deliver on this, though, they're going to have to crank up the pace of active development. As of now, there's only eight games that have been announced that are in development. One is Jedi Survivor, expected to release in early 2023. One is a mobile game that I won't be covering or mentioning on my channel. One is the Knights of the Old Republic remake, now being helmed by Saber Interactive, and we likely won't see that until 2025. One is Star Wars Eclipse, which likewise isn't expected to be seen until 2026 or even later. Of the remaining four, two are in development at Respawn, one untitled first-person shooter and one untitled strategy game. Amy Hennig is at the helm of one at Skydance Media, and Ubisoft's massive entertainment, known for their work on The Division and The Division 2, is developing the last of the announced eight games. Obviously, even dividing these games up charitably over a release window, the two games per fiscal year release schedule doesn't work with what we know about, and it's probably not the case that we're going to immediately see this release schedule come to fruition if we're just hearing about this desire from Disney now. But smaller scale games are faster to develop and quality test, so with any luck, this news might mean that we start seeing more small scale Star Wars games announced and released starting as soon as next year when EA's exclusive license expires. Since, in all likelihood, this market strategy has been in play for some time and we're only just hearing about this now. There's also some wiggle room in this story from Inside Gaming that gives me some pause. When Disney says smaller games, I think squadrons-like, when what Disney could mean is mobile. This possibility is terrifying since it means fewer quality games overall for us. Not that mobile necessarily means low quality microtransaction bait, but historically that's what it has meant and publishers have seen time and time again that they can push out a predatory trash pile like Diablo Immortal, and as long as it has a beloved IP attached to it and the developer has an army of simps online to defend it, it'll make hundreds of millions of dollars. It's definitely not realistic to expect Disney and Lucasfilm games to abandon the mobile platform altogether, even if I'd like them to, but I guess the best we can do is hope that more of these quote smaller games are in the same vein as Squadrons and available on PC and consoles. That's all the news I have for you today. Please like the video if you like it, dislike it if you disliked it, and consider subscribing for future content. And if you'd like to know how speedrunners beat Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order in under an hour, click the video on the right side of the screen now. Goodbye, my friends, and may the Force be with you.